Hello, Camp Pros, and welcome to the Camp Hacker Podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about some, as usual in the show, talking about the big issues in camp. And as we're recording this on the 1st of April, we're going to be talking about what to do if your camp does not run in 2020. And I want to welcome you all to that discussion. My name is Travis Allison, and I run an the Summer Camp Professionals group on Facebook, campmavericks.com, and I work with camps in helping them prepare strategies for their marketing and communications. And I'm Gabrielle Rail, and I'm one of the camp directors at Camp Waro. Camp Waro is an all-girls camp in the Laurentian Mountains, and we focus on creating a positive female community while doing that both in French and English. And my name's Joe Richards. I'm the executive director at Pierce Williams Summer Camp and Retreat Facility. Um, we're part of the United Church of Canada's larger, um, one of the 55 camps across Canada. And uh, I have been here for a long time, 16 years. So, Well, welcome to you both. We're sad Dan is unable to join us uh, today. But uh, we wanted to open up this topic. We know it's a serious one, but we think it's exactly the right conversation for Camp Hacker to be having and for our audience to be a part of. So welcome to that. As usual, I'll say this now and repeat it later. As usual, if you have any comments or thoughts on this, then please feel free to reach out to me directly, Travis at GoCamp.pro and and or to Gavin Joe if you hear something I'll get them to give you contact information at the end. So we're recording on the 1st of April in 2020 and thinking about what camp is going to look like and what the impacts uh, of the virus are on summer programs and thought it would be important to just acknowledge that there's a real possibility that camp may not run we're not saying that camp won't, won't run or there won't be some form of camp somewhere or that your camp won't do something that looks like what you know as summer camp this year, but there is a strong possibility for most camps that there won't be a camp program in the summer. And we wanted to acknowledge that and think that through. And Gab, I wonder for you, what are the sort of things that you think people should be considering? Uh, I asked this question, I, I phrase it that way because I happen to read Um, some stuff online from people saying, I'm just staying positive. I'm only focusing on we're going to run. And I was kind of surprised that people weren't, were choosing to not in any way acknowledge this possibility. But what are some of the sort of thing, what are the, some of the things that you think people should be considering, uh, discussing, et cetera? I think the, I think that we can start to see patterns happening around the world and wherever you are listening to this podcast is to try to assess um, from those patterns where you might be in the next three months or four months. And um, the two things that I'm looking at is safety and finance and, and safety is first, you know, uh, kids need camp, uh, staff need camp. Uh, for, for morale, for learning, for energy, for getting geared up for school. Um, I know that for me, camp was extremely important before I went to school. I felt at the end of school that like my battery was depleted and at the end of camp, my battery was recharged and I needed that space. However, if it's not a safe enough environment for our children, if it's going to spread um, COVID-19 further, we have to make those decisions and looking at those patterns is going to help uh, assess that risk. And then of course is our finances and what is, when do we pull the plug so that we can make sure that we're running in 2021. And those are the two pieces that I'm looking uh, right, looking at right now. And I'm not saying that myself and my camp is deciding to pull the plug. It's just that we're assessing the patterns that are happening uh, as we speak. Yeah, of course. Joe, what sort of stuff is top of mind for for you and your work at Pierce Williams? Well, top of mind for me is keeping your camp, if camp doesn't run, is, is keeping your, keeping yourself in front of your camper parents in your community, right? Be, be helpful, be present, um, offer something. Um, and, and top of mind is that we're we need to look for we need to think about the ways to get the people who are going to miss this summer it's like the seniors who are all missing the end of their their senior year in high school or 
And um, it's this idea that what about those people who are going to be counselors in training this summer? What about those there? I'm sure there's people out there <coughs> who thought that this there, I know this happens, right? You have summer staff where like, I can do one more summer at camp. This will be my final summer. And if that doesn't exist, how are you going to help them? Because emotionally they're not, they weren't prepared last summer for that to be their final summer. So you need to think through a whole variety of things, but I, the things I wrote down were connect, contribute, and, and be part of the community, right? And if you do those things outside of um, the normal operations of camp, I think that that will situate you into a better place, right? And um, I, I just think that, right, if imagine, I, I hadn't thought about it until I heard Gab talking, but imagine that summer camps don't run in Canada, let's say using Canada as a context, the the current bailout plan for for finances for people who are working, all of those summer students are gonna be without a job too. Because if we're socially isolating physical distancing until August, right, those students in, those people who are going back to university relied on that money that they were gonna make this summer. So what are what are what are we going to do to help them and and what will we be able to do? But I think that top of mind is this idea that you shouldn't put it out of your head, right? You shouldn't just think to yourself, I'm only thinking that we're going to run because at no point, one of the things my mind does is always goes to worst case scenario, right? Like just, you know, what if? And then my mind just strategically figures out what if, right? Like, oh, well, if this, then that, and, and I'll move on. And so I've already thought through some of the if camp doesn't run. And for us, it's a lot of, and I'm sure for most camps, it's a lot of financial consideration as well, right? How do you shut down buildings that, so that there is zero, <laughs> not net neutral, I mean like zero dollars being spent on that building as we go through the summer and, and canceling services and all of those things, so. Well, and there's, because I think sometimes what, what we're thinking about is that there's so much planning that's going to need to go into if camp runs, if we, if we just decide to do it six weeks instead of eight weeks, if um, we, you know, shift from, you know, model of 100% to, you know, 30%, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a lot of planning that needs to go into if we don't run, if we want to, if we want to stay stay alive it, to see 2021 we need a lot of planning when it comes to connecting with our campers our staff members our families um, our site there's a lot our finances there's so much planning and i think that th we have so much to do at this point but this is not the time to ignore that other column there's two columns that we need to look at the scenarios of if you are going to run and the scenario if you're not going to run and how are you going to manage that and you have to start planning. Well, and I want to talk through some of those details today, but I uh, I keep thinking about something that I heard Joe say, I suppose last week, um, where we are thinking about the, we need to, as, as summer camp professionals, we need to be thinking about the, uh, I'll remind you and then get you to, to say it, Joe, but um, just thinking about, the, the capital C camp that we are we're making decisions that are good for camp in the long term, even if that means that we somehow at some with great kindness and great patience have to disappoint individuals have to disappoint the 2020 staff have to disappoint the 2020 campers, but there is a big long term picture that we are required to think about as summer camp professionals. Yeah, so in, I did a webinar last week on difficult conversations, and, and I think what you're leading to is this idea that I know that one of, the, one of your philosophies, Travis, is, and, and Bess, is, is people before program, but, but now we're, we're past program, right? Like at this point, it's community before individual, and it's organization and mission before people, right? Because if you still need to make sure your people are okay, 
But if you want your organization to fulfill their mission for the next, for us, let's say another 60 years, if we don't survive this, right, no matter how many people I've pissed off in the motions of doing it. And, and right, we had a conversation today on, on, um, <clears throat> on our weekly management meeting and, and somebody said, so you're saying there's a chance we might not come back like as staff. And I was like, I'm not saying there's not a chance, right? Like there at this point, everything is, everything is up in the air. And, and I think the most important thing is that if you can look at this two ways, you can look at it as, Hey, for Pierce Williams, it's been a great 60 years. This is our 60 year anniversary. What a great way to go out. Just be like, okay, see ya and go out full stop right. or <clears throat> right. You build on this and you go, great for this one year. Can we sacrifice this one summer, this, uh, this silent summer where camps will be silent, where bells will not ring. And can we, can we sacrifice this one summer so that the next hundred years can have camp, right? So that, and, and put all those things in place. But yeah, it's the idea of your mission is more important in the end and, and your reputation is more important than individuals. You, you have to, do whatever you can. And I, I, I've used that terminology with my board. I said, this is going to be a life and death struggle for our, our organization. If we do not make the right choices, we will not be around to make choices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, um, Gab, did you have some thoughts you wanted to add to what Joe said or? I mean, no, I, I think it's, I think it's important. I think there's a difference between optimism and, um, and, uh, and planning. And I like planning and because it makes me optimistic. I am by nature an optimistic individual, but because I have plans um, to help back, back that up. And I think that if you need to sell it in any way, I think the seriousness that Joe is talking about life and death um, is very important to, to be clear to people. And then I think the selling point is we can be the rise of the Phoenix. We, we can, we can in 50 years from now, I want not just camp individuals and not just our members to be looking back at our organization, but I want our communities to be looking back and say, this is what this organization, this is how they, they rose and they brought other people up with them. And I think, that in these darker, you know, in these tougher times, we have an opportunity to do that. And whether you run or not, it's still going to, you still have to have the mentality of a rise of the Phoenix because there's going to be some very tough summers ahead, uh, most likely. So I was thinking we could break up the next piece of this into two streams of thought. Um, one is sort of the practical, what happens if camp doesn't open, uh, like the practical things, what do we have to, what do we, what should we be considering in terms of staffing and site and, uh, contracts and all of that stuff. And then another bigger problem, like how do we help camp get through to another summer when we can open? So I think practically camps will, if it, in this scenario that we want to talk, we want to address directly, if camp doesn't run in 2020, then there are different things. As Joe said, they're going to look at how can they close up buildings to a point that they don't cost money to maintain. But there are lots of other pieces to that, that sites will, owning a property, if you are a property owner and your campus owns a property, you're still going to have to have maintenance done on your property. You will you won't be able to come back um, without a ton of work to, to reopen a, a property. What are some other things that we need to be thinking about? Just the practical, camp doesn't run, what might people be missing thinking about? I think all of the different tiers, Joe also mentioned CITs. I think looking at all of that, we can call them perhaps graduation points within your organization. So at the very youngest group, that group that comes in at that time, um, and the oldest group that leaves, how do we make sure that we have the two youngest groups that come in in the following year? 
um, what do you do with that CIT program where you have a certain or LIT program that you have a, a large group of potential wonderful staff members? What are you going to do with those individuals, um, uh, people that are moving from uh, junior counselor to activity heads to leadership team members? And those leader, young leadership team members that just came in for their first year this year, how do we keep them engaged for next year to make sure that they're staying with us so that we're not losing that gap um, and that you're keeping some of those leadership team members um, to help carry on if they had different plans that this was going to be their last year, as, as Joe has mentioned, um, how do you keep them on? So I would look at all of the different tiers uh, within your organization and those maybe graduation points and what are we going to do to, to, to make adjustments for them? Because we'll have to make adjustments no matter what you, we can't just say, okay, now our LIT program is double the size. We need to adjust accordingly. And, um, and, and all, so, so those pieces I would think about. Yeah, there's, I think the, the wording to sum it up is that there are people who are going to miss out on a rite of passage, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're going to miss out on, on those points that we have been so intentional for so many years of, of, of having them walk through these specific steps at camp. And then all of a sudden it's like, you're going down the stairs and you miss a step, right? And you're like, Holy crap. And, and, and I think that that's the case. I think that the practical things people need to think about are, you know, is the maintenance end of this. I heard a lot of camps. The first thing they did was lay off their maintenance people as opposed to office people. And I think that's a, that's a really okay. short sighted, a really short sighted view. I think that you need to look at um, relationships with your suppliers as well. Um, asking for um, asking for more time to pay things or um, how, because you know, how you are going to um, rethink those relationships. I think that the practical things are to be really upfront and honest with your parents and with your staff right? If you have signed contracts um, and those staff, this is the challenging thing. And I said this last night to our leadership team as we were on a, a call, right? If I said, I'm not sure that camp's going to go ahead. And if you don't want to think about that and you get your, right now you're finding your quiet place and your positivity and planning for camp, then plan for camp. Right. If that's where you're getting your, your mental energy is being like, well, at least at the end of this, I'll have camp, then plan for camp. But in the back of your head, there is a possibility that we need to shift this whole thing online. But you still, even if we do that, you need a plan for camp. So go ahead and plan for camp. Because people, kids think about this year long, right? my daughter has thought about this moment coming up for years. Because she's, she's going to be a CIT. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. That's huge. And so, and she's grown up at camp, right? And she's never seen a summer where camp sits empty. So if camp doesn't run, I think the practical viewpoint is to, is to make sure you can get through to the next year. And if that looks like laying off all of your full-time staff as well, like you need to do what you need to do. Your mission has got to be, if your mission is not stronger than your, your relationship to that person, then, then you're making the choice. And, and that's fine. That can, be, that can be your choice. You can all go down with the ship or you can throw them off the boat and hope to God that you do not sink. Right. But like, it's in how you tell them that that's going to be what you're doing. You're like, I'm putting a lifeboat out there. And in Canada, we call that our social support network. Right. So you're on EI for the next so many weeks and employment insurance. And, but like, but if you want your mission in and I think for a lot of owners and boards of directors, this is a scary, scary time, right? Like 
I think practically you need to think through what are our financial liabilities currently, right? How much money have we collected? How much money have we collected for camp this summer already um, that we will either need to pay back or figure out a way to shift it to the following year, uh, figure out those policies. Um, how do we implement, how are we going to implement the new policies that will surely come down over the next year in regards to pandemic planning at camp, right? I think practically you need to think through that, that this is just a tip of an iceberg and it's gonna be rough for quite a while to think through all of these things. And I want to pick up on on something that you said there, Joe. A lot of camps are saying, you know, we can't, we we just won't be able to refund money. Or camps that are working with their families and saying, if you absolutely have to have the money back, we'll give it back to you. And or, you know, would you would be willing to consider shifting some of this money to pay for next year? And I think that that is a fine survival mechanism, but there's a piece of that that not a, I don't think everybody's acknowledging. So if you don't run this summer and you convince 75% of your parents to just shift their money to next year, when yeah. you come and start to spend for next year's mm -hmm. program, that money's not going to be there. That's survival money between now and then. Um, or that's what I, I hear Cam saying is we're going to have to spend that for staffing. We're going to have to say, spend that on the maintenance, on our contracts, getting out our contracts, et cetera. And so you are, you have, call it 75% of full, just for a number. Um, so 75% of your income from 2020, you have said that you're going to give credit in 2021 to that 75% of your income, but you still have 20, you still have hundred percent of the expenses. And so the camps have to be considering if they're talking about this, giving credit next year, they basically have to be saying they have to more than double their income next year to pay for camp as it has been yeah. run. And exactly. I think everybody's like, we're just going to do this so we can survive. We'll convince the families to send to, to shift the money for next year. But if that will allow us to keep the doors open so we can serve, I get that. People, that's a decision you make. But I'm not convinced everybody's understanding the implications of that, that even if you minimize your expenses to the best of your abilities, you are going to be extremely short of cash next year. Um, if you convince families to leave the money with you until then. Well, and I think that's where this goes right back to the difficult conversations talk, right? Like you, is it more important to keep those staff on currently or to, you know, to, to lay them off or to save money now? And I think, sorry, Joe, I think that one of the things, like it's going to feel like starting camp from scratch, if that's the case finding new staff or, you know, keeping one or one staff on who can keep the site going and sort of have a director head on for the future. It's going to feel like starting camp from scratch, but making this tough decision now, figure out a way to make it through till next year and your own camp finances, however that works out. There is the institutional memory or you have to make sure, I think that's part of the, the hard thoughtfulness is you have to make sure that the institutional memory is there so that when you hire somebody next year who may not be a lifer, who may not have grown up at camp and stayed with you between now and then, you have to have the institutional memory so that you can pull stuff off the shelf and say, okay, this is how we run hiring. This is how we run the day-to-day -day program. You're not starting from complete scratch if you're smart now, yeah. if you're thinking through, you know, you know, some people it's gonna be just too late that they haven't required their senior staff to leave or update and edit a binder of what the daily go-to jobs are for that thing. That's just sort of passed down because I watched somebody do it last year. That's not gonna work. I think that um, camps need to be thoughtful about that part of it too. Like how does the memory carry into 2021 if we don't run in 2020. As all of us know, whoever, if you've been a camp director for three years or more, you know, and I've said this on the show many times, if you change something one year, the next year, the first year there'll be a fight about it, the next year it will have always been so. And so for a generation of camp people, 
there won't have be camp like they won't have the memory of what camp is so people won't remember oh this is how we begin a meal this is the cleaning procedures when plates need to be scraped and put them into the dish pit um this was the, you know this is how we get kids off the bus and get them to a flagpole to start the day or like that stuff won't be there unless it's written down and if you haven't written it down yet you might have been too late <laughs> right like you can still sure. now you can still use some of that now but this is why this is why final reports or transition reports are so important and processes for your camp office for full-time staff right this goes to the whole philosophy and i've talked about it on the show before right the the death the detour or the departure right so are you ready if somebody dies are you ready if somebody if there's a detour or are you ready if there's a departure of someone heck we're going through all three of those things, right? Like in, in a sense, we're, we're hitting the, the devastation, the fourth D <laughs> that I've never put in, right? Devastation of an industry and of, of your own facility and your own programs. Yeah. Right. Gab, I saw you had a thought. I just think uh, for the financial aspects, um, 100% I've, been, I've also been hearing individuals saying, well, just ask families if we can defer their finances and, and you're like, you're putting yourself at risk for 2021. And I think, I think thinking through how you communicate with your families and I think explaining to them your reality and looking at a third option of them donating a portion of that to camp and putting it to next to the 2021, just looking at, you know, some families it won't be possible at all. And that's a reality because of our financial situations. But some families really appreciate, I mean, I, I think about it this way. I have a favorite, favorite restaurant that's just down the street from me. Um, I go there for breakfast often. I go there with my brother. And if, let's just say, yeah, Travis likes it too. And uh, let's just say that, um, um, you know, they, they ask for a deposit every time I reserved $20. Let's just say that was my, the, the case. And then this happened and they gave me three options. Option A, uh, we'll refund you. Option B, we'll put it to your next meal. Option C, it would really help us keep our staff paid during this time, um, but no pressure. $20 for me, for a restaurant that I really care about that's been good to me, I'm okay with $20. And maybe there's certain families, I know it's not $20, but maybe you know, $500 for some families that have sent their kids there and they, they love what you do and understand what you're going through. Maybe for them, it's not, it will be okay. So I think also being transparent with your families and communicating the realities of your situation because, you know, they send your, their kids to your place. They, they care about you, not everybody, but a lot of them do. And, um, and being transparent with them might be part of the plan. I think actually not might be, it should be part of the plan to communicate with your families about your reality. Of course, you want to figure out what your reality is first. Of course, you need to, line all of those ducks up in a row before you present it to them so that it's calm and it's collected and, and you're clear with what you're messaging, but um, they're your allies as well. And, um, and it's not just your alumni, it's, it's them as well. And let them know, bring them in on your circle, let them know what you need and see what they can do to, to help you out. Absolutely. And I think that past the practical part of uh, of this decision is we need to also be as intentional with our community in this situation as we are in our everyday life at camp. So um, there will be some form of mourning if camp doesn't run this summer. And you need to acknowledge that. I think you need to try to figure out ways to bring people together online, whatever, to celebrate camp, all of the things that camp has done. This is not assuming that you're gonna to have to close your camp, but just assuming that you're gonna to have to take a year off. Part of this community maintenance, community connection piece is acknowledging that this is going to be emotionally hard for people other than just your staff and campers or just your staff, but it's going to be hard for campers. It's going to be hard for alumni. Um, ever, it's going to make people so scared for the future. Um, those who have found comfort just in the fact that camp exists 
And when you're a camp director long enough, you hear that from some camp people who are like, I know I haven't been connected, but I've seen you posting on, on social media. And I just, I just take comfort in the fact that another kid like me will have this place. And so you have to acknowledge the fears that people are going through and the loss that they will be suffering. And I think it's important to make some sort of celebration or ritual around that to be nice to your community, to support your community the best way you can, and because it matters towards your camp's future. Well, and and I know we got a, not a strange email. Well, it is a strange email in these times today. Shannon was saying, my office manager was saying she got an email from a group who hasn't used us in like five years, who said, when this thing is all said and done, we can't wait to celebrate as a community together with you at Pierce and we're like, that's awesome. There's a great marketing strategy for when this thing is all said and done, right? Like, yes, get together. I think that, I think we're going to have to help people realize that together isn't dangerous and you shouldn't be afraid of being together. I think that <clears throat> from a non-practical side, right? Right it goes beyond camp this this could be the the push for my idea that every kid goes to camp right like that you have government funding to send every kid yeah. to camp we're right. about to spend one one and a half uh you know 110 trillion dollars is that billion are we a billion we're a billion we're a billion yes billion. one and a half bi no 105 billion dollars there you go um and my proposal for every kid going to camp is it costs well under, you know, well under a hundred million. So like we're, <laughs> that's the cheap, but yeah. Yeah. Anything Gab, that you would think <clears throat> that we haven't touched on that people should be thinking about or, or is important to be considering as a summer camp professional at this moment? The only thing I can say is, is um, is to create your own risk assessment tool, and I think that the that we're going to get so many highs. Not, no, we are getting a lot of lows, and with minor peaks of highs, and it sometimes feels like you're in quicksand. Or um, as the analogy of Joe, we're in a boat, and as every time you're bailing out, a huge wave crashes over, and to make decisions while you're on this rocky boat, a risk assessment tool is going to assist you. And if you don't know where to start, start with just reverse engineer it. Go backwards and say, when do I need to know, when do I need enough time to train my staff? How much money will I have at that point? What staff members will be available? And go backwards and, and create a tool that's gonna to help guide you and your organization in making decisions because if you're making decisions on your own, you're gonna second guess yourself, so the tool is gonna to be very useful. If you're making decisions with other people, then, then there's a consensus on what, what you're talking about, and as well as it's, it's something that you'll be able to explain to your staff members and to your families, that we have been assessing it in a diligent way. Um, and it, there's no magical tool yet that's out. I know I'm working on one myself. Once it's done, I'll share it. Um, but it's, it's something that I think is essential to help with communication, with planning, and making sure uh, that our camps are safe first and foremost. And I think it's worth saying that the American Camp Association has put out a document about looking at the impact, like it's, it is a, a really good decision-making tool. And that's available in the COVID-19 and Camp Slack. It's available on the ACA COVID-19 page. Uh, it's a PDF that you can download that has given a framework and some good bullets for starting that decision-making um, tool. So I think that's a great place to end that topic. Um, yeah. And so thank you for leaving us there, Gab. Uh, before we move on to the next section, I want to take one second and just acknowledge and thank Oliver and Matt who run our First Class Counselors podcast. Up until now, First Class Counselors has been part of the Camp Hacker feed, but just this spring we decided to break it out and give it its own uh, and give it its own feed. So if you enjoy that, 
and or want to send it to your staff members, search for First Class Counselors in your podcast app and download it there. And I think First Class Counselors could be a great tool for you for keeping your community, your counselor community connected, keeping them thinking about what it means to be a young youth development professional at summer camp. And just hear some wise words from young camp leaders who have you know, been counselors much more recently than the three or four of us in the room. And uh, they've got some really great stuff to share. So please search for First Class Counselors from Go Camp Pro on your podcast app and subscribe to those. That means we're moving on to our, our tool of the week. Uh, Joe, I know that you are on your way out. So I wonder if you can uh, give us your tool and then go on to just give us a quick a way to contact you um, if people have follow-up questions about things you said. Yeah, for sure. So my tool of the week, if you're watching on YouTube, you get a special treat. Um, my tool of the week is just uh, strange collections. Um, currently, I'm holding uh, five different foam heads, which is like the uh, Packers uh, cheese head, but oh, everybody else makes them. I actually have permission to collect them from my wife, but my, the rule is I'm only allowed to buy one if I buy it there. I can't order it to come to my house. Um, <laughs> the reason I say strange collections. Your, your tool, Joe, should be uh, collecting rules and restrictions as well as accommodation <laughs> agreements with your partner. <laughs> but it's, strange collections are also things like if you have a hobby, like I have all these woodworking magazines. The funny thing is when I was a camp counselor and even now that I'm a camp director and executive director, Staff love to find out things about you that they don't know. And friends, like my longtime friends on this podcast, can all of, often be surprised, right? Mm. Staff, staff, who, um, staff who've known me for 10 years and then find out something, they're like, I never knew that, right? So that's a strange. But the collections thing is, years ago, I had this, um, <clears throat> I had this, uh, <laughs> this bucket mm. idea um, and this was back in high school. I did uh, leadership training stuff all through high school. And um, I brought my bucket to all the conferences I went to so that I would have um, just a bucket full of things that I could share with people. And sometimes it's like stuffed animals. And sometimes it's like um, just uh, things to eat like wasabi peas or um, or things like a, a clear lock, right? So that you can see the pins or, yeah. or, or card tricks or what else is there? Oh, blank deck of cards. These are uh, useful those. for the world. Uh, an Olympic Coca-Cola. Strange collections are, go a long way. <laughs> and, um, and what the bucket does is for staff and for campers, it'll allow them to see into your mind in a way that they don't normally see into your mind they don't normally see right that you um <clears throat> that you love small puzzles right that you love the they don't know these things because you don't share that with people and if you do share that with people more power to you um but it's the idea of small collections which gets them interested and gives them things to do and your bucket also becomes a great seat when you're teaching as well so Strange collections. The foam heads are difficult. I'm trying to think of a way to hang them in my office. Um, I just got uh, someone donated a wood lathe to me. And so I might just turn like fake heads to put on my wall and figure out how to mount them so that I can pull them off for my battle stilts uh, performances. Oh, lathe is fun to play with. That's cool. I know. But uh, I need to get going. Um, if you want to reach out to me, because I know you're going to ask Travis, uh, two places, uh, campusbetter.com and yoyojoe.com. On yoyojoe.com, I currently, uh, I am not competing with the mega doc for COVID-19, but uh, I do have a page of interesting articles that I find, and it's a good place for me. So if you just go to yoyojoe.com, there's a COVID, uh, COVID information page. So cool. Thanks, uh, it was so great seeing you guys. Thanks. And ladies, both of you. Okay. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Uh, Gab, I like what your tool is. I like the practicality of your tool, so I'm going to have you do it last. Okay, cool. It's my turn first. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one app that we are using only started when um, 
when these, the isolation started. We're using an app called Marco Polo, which is a free app that you can put on any smartphone. And it is a way to record video messages to a person or to a group of people. So our family is all scattered within an hour of us, but scattered and we are um, going through lots of stuff as everybody else's family is. In particular, we had been planning for a, a wedding, our, my oldest mm -hmm. stepson um, and his partner were, were supposed to get married in May and our first grandchild is coming in May. And so we are using Marco Polo as a way to encourage just little short, sometimes silly, um, messages to each other on video. It's kind of every day, here's what I'm doing, here's what we're up to, we're taking the dog for a walk, stuff like that. Um, some of you may know Chantel Match Jackson, who has been a guest host on the podcast many times. She and I send each other messages almost every day where all we do is say the word fart to each other in different tones. And <laughs> that is the whole content. Just she's in Ireland and I'm here in Canada. And it's just a way for us to keep in touch with our own silly relationship. But the family part of it's great. But um, it has the been. The fart part is what's fun. important. The fart part is important, <laughs> yes. Uh, and other friends that I have a mastermind class who have only seen me sit at this desk and um, getting to show them around our house and our yard and, and things, and they're all over the world. And so um, it has been something that um, definitely been really enjoying. So the Marco mm. Polo app, again, like. Um, like usual, if you go to camphacker.tv slash podcast, you will find the show notes from this uh, episode, and you can find the link to that, or just search the App Store for Marco Polo, and then you're good. This, by the way, will be episode 127. Gab, yeah. what's your tip? Uh, my tip is, uh, for so for the past couple of weeks, I've been working from home, and so that means I haven't been getting out. I usually can walk to work. I can't walk to work. Um, and my hours have been longer uh, at the desk uh, for meetings and doing work, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, I had a lot of romantic ideas of me getting up early in the morning to go for, for big long walks before my work day, and that didn't work out. I had ideas of doing it in the evening that also didn't work out, work out in the way. So I've started doing, when I have one-on-one -on -one meetings, so just one person and another, um, going for a walk with my phone and having those meetings with those individuals so I can actually get up and move. And so my tool of the week is wireless headphones. Um, I put the ones I have right now, but there's cheaper ones out there. I think for me, it's more about finding a way to get up and go. And I, I really feel that one, it's gonna help with your productivity, for your health, for your mental wellness. But so in these times, sometimes it's really difficult to, to prioritize that. So. Um, and I find that walking and talking, I am more productive. I'm, I listen a little bit better for those ADDers out there. We listen better when we move. So, so, uh, so yeah, so walk and talk is my tip of the week. And the tool is if you have any, uh, headphones that you can use. That's a great one. Thanks, Gab. Uh, Gab, if people have a follow-up question, where do they get in touch with you? You can find me on Facebook or on Instagram at Gabrielle Rail, and that's two L's. And I work at uh, world.com, so you can check me out there too. That's great, Gab. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate Thanks. it. Uh, wonderful. So I want to say thank you to everybody who's been listening or watching. If you are on YouTube, I encourage you to. Um, click the subscribe button if this is the first episode you followed so that you get notified when we put out new shows. You can also, there's a little bell there that will send you an email when new Camp Hacker shows come out or camp, go, all of the Go Camp Pro shows, not just the Camp Hacker podcast. They all get posted there as well. I would like to take a minute and thank our executive producer, Matt Hansberger, who edits the show, writes our show notes, does everything related to all of the Go Camp Pro podcasts, and does it tirelessly with a ton of creativity and a, a great patience for um, the lot of us who are recording all our shows. So thank you to Matt. Um, as I'd say, Matt is with Oliver, the co-host of First Class Counselors as well. So please go to camphacker.tv slash podcast to find the show notes from this episode and previous episodes as well. Thank you for the evening, friends. <laughs>